I'm going to go through a couple of housekeeping things quickly, and then we'll get this show on the road. So again, I work for the Legal Insurrection Foundation. That said, though, please keep in mind that the opinions that you hear tonight are those of the individuals on the panel and not necessarily indicative of the organizations which employ them. Um, but these are issues that I know we are all very passionate about. This event is also free to you. We subsist completely on donations and we take what donations we do receive and put them directly back into programming um, in the hopes that the information that we're providing is helpful, is educational, is enlightening, and will enable you to get involved in ways that make sense for you to do so. So throughout the event, uh, we will, I'll be monitoring both the Q&A and um, the comment section. If you have questions for the panelists, please put them in the Q&A section. When we get to the Q&A portion of the event, I'll be going through and I'll be posing those questions to the panelists. In the chat section, we ask that you keep your chat on topic. As we're introducing our panelists, I'll be providing links to their background to the work that they've done in the chat section so that you can reference that or save those links for later if you would like to do so. And so this evening, again, I'm, I'm incredibly excited um, about this panel where we're going to take a deep dive into the 1619 project and how it has infiltrated education, not just in the higher education level, but primary education as well. And so without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and introduce my boss, Professor Jacobson, who is also the president of the Legal Insurrection Foundation and a clinical law professor at Cornell Law School. You're muted. I think you're muted. Good. Okay. I am always the first one to make that mistake. <laughs> every time that we do this. Um, I wanted to thank everybody for coming. I think we're gonna have a good turnout tonight, which is always nice. And um, I think we've got a, an all-star panel with, and I'm the, the weakest link on this all-star panel. Um, wanna thank uh, Dr. Lucas Morrell, Mary Graybar, Dr. Mary Graybar and Ian Rowe. Uh, they really understand the 1619 project at a much deeper level than I do. They are scholars on the history, they're scholars on the educational effort, and they are people involved in trying to unravel what is something extremely negative that's happening. My focus is a little different. My focus is more on the political end of things. What does this all mean for the politics? And the 1619 project, in my view, you really have to look at as a political project. Uh, it's produced by the New York Times. So to me, it's automatically suspect if it's produced by the New York Times. Why is the New York Times even purporting to produce history, much less history that is going to be used in education, particularly at the younger grades? And it is, I forget what the numbers are, the other panelists probably aware of it, but this has infiltrated or is being used extensively already. And there is a push to get it to go forward even deeper into the educational system. But based on what I've read about it, what I've read from it, uh, it is really journalism masquerading as history. And the good thing is, They've kind of admitted that, not kind of, they have admitted that. Uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones admitted it in some tweets that I was just pulling from one of our old posts before this program, which have now been removed. I don't know if they've been permanently deleted or just temporarily removed. And in that moment of candor on the internet, she was very upfront about what this is. It is a... The, she says in a delete, now deleted tweet in July, the end of July, 2020, uh, she says the 1619 project is not about history. It's about memory. And she goes on to say in another tweet, also now deleted, I've always said that the 1619 project is not a history. It is a work of journalism 
that explicitly seeks to challenge the national narrative. She goes on in another tweet to say, the crazy thing is the 1619 project is using history and reporting to make an argument. It never pretended to be a history. And then in, in one more tweet, she says, the fight here is about who gets to control the national narrative. And I think that is really the way politically I view the 1619 Project. It is part of a political project by the New York Times to change the historical narrative of the United States and to reframe it. It is not an attempt to create a neutral history or an objective history or a history which gives fair account to all the different views and all the different presentations. It is frankly, by their own admission, essentially propaganda. By design, it is meant to be political and it's meant to create a political narrative. And the question I always have is, why are these people in our schools? What is a political project, which by their own admission is meant to, to create and argue a narrative? What is it doing in our schools? This needs to get out. And the other panelists will go into detail as to the inaccuracies, but it was all over the internet when there was an enormous error uh, in the 1619 project, really its foundational narrative, uh, which was that the reason for the American Revolution was to preserve slavery. And it was historians that I've read on the on you know uh, various articles. Oddly enough, it was a website run by the Socialist Workers Party or some socialist historical party or whatever it is who said, wait a second, this is all wrong. And uh, they went into great detail and they finally were meant to retract that, to remove it, but it was the foundational narrative of the 1619 Project. So my view is much like our prior programs on critical race theory in higher ed and critical race theory in K through 12, is that this is something that is pernicious, which is already within the gates, to use, to use a phrase. The, the educational barbarians are already inside the gates. It is too late to keep them out. And one of the things we think about a lot, and I'm sure other panelists will talk about, is what can we do to undo the damage that's already been done? What can we do to depoliticize it? Um, I know that Everybody on this panel has worked on that before, uh, and they'll tell you about what they've done and what they're doing. But that's really my big takeaway from the 1619 Project, is it is not education. By their own admission, it is politics, and it needs to get out of our educational system. And that's why we titled this panel, History and Education, Rescuing History and Education because it has been damaged already. There probably are, you know, multiple, there's at least a year of students around the country in various locations who've been taught something that is not act historically accurate, that is propagandistic. And that is, uh, and Mary will appreciate this, part of the, the Howard zinification of our educational system. And Mary wrote a great book, uh, Debunking Howard Zinn. Uh, that, I forget if that's the exact title, but that's basically what it was. I recommend it to everybody. And so that's what I think the project is. And so I'm looking forward to hearing from the scholars on this panel on history, on the Civil War, on um, the revolution, and people who've actually worked in education and are involved in projects now to try to undo this damage. So that's where I come out. This is political. Get it out of our schools and let's start afresh. Thank you, Professor Jacobson, uh, for that great introduction to this topic. And so next up, we have Dr. Lucas Morell, who is a uh, professor of politics at Washington and Lee University. So I'm going to turn it over to 
to Dr. Morell and I'll put information about his background in the chat section. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Jacobson, for the invitation to speak on this project. It's hard to believe it's almost been two years since it came out in August of uh, 2019. When Nicole Hannah Jones published her essay arguing that 1619, not 1776, represented America's, in her words, true founding, she was challenging the most traditional understanding of the formation of the United States. She was proposing that the most significant event in our nation's history was not when we actually became a nation by declaring our political independence from Great Britain on the basis of universal principles applicable to all human beings everywhere. Instead, the mere arrival of 20 plus slaves, uh, African slaves near the English colony of Jamestown marked a way of life that she asserts was the driver of all American history. Uh, she asks us to reject the most famous dating of America's birth, that by Abraham Lincoln at Gettysburg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Is Nicole Hannah Jones or Abraham Lincoln correct? Lincoln delivered the most famous speech in American history in the middle of a civil war, a war he believed was a test as to whether any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. Lincoln believed that at the beginning of this country was a commitment to the equality of men, as he put it, as its central idea, where the enforcement of that equality would follow, as he said, as fast as circumstances should permit. But his election as president eventually led white Americans in 11 slaveholding states to secede, as they put it, an attempt to found a new nation devoted not to equality, but inequality, white enslavement of black people. Now, if America was founded on slavery and existed to perpetuate it, why on earth did all the slave states except for four, the so-called border slave states, why did all the rest of them try to secede from the United States? They believed slavery, in fact, would be insecure under a Lincoln administration, and they actually formed a new constitution in order to strengthen the protections for slavery. When Nicole Hannah Jones say that there's no difference between a Confederate constitution that protected Negro slavery explicitly and the U.S. constitution that, yes, made compromises or concessions to slavery, but included mechanisms to reduce its influence on America. Now, if you want a real nation founded on slavery, Exhibit A is not the American nation governing itself under the US Constitution, but the attempt of Southern states to govern themselves under a Confederate Constitution. It denied Congress the power to pass a, quote, law denying or impairing the right of property in Negro slaves, end quote. It also provided that in any territory acquired by the Confederate states, quote, the institution of Negro slavery as it now exists in the Confederate states shall be recognized and protected by Congress and by the territorial government, end quote. It added that the inhabitants of the several Confederate states and territories shall have the right to take to such territory any slaves lawfully held by them in any of the states or territories of the Confederate states. So in some, the seceding states believe slavery would be safer outside of the American Union, not inside. And they were willing to start a war to defend that proposition. Now, I know Nicole Hannah Jones several months ago now claims that she didn't really mean the nation was actually founded in 1619. She was tr just trying to, she put it, reframe how Americans think about their past how they remember their history. As she, as she said, the fight here is about who gets to control the national narrative and therefore the nation's shared memory of itself. But her narrative, which is really a fancy word for story, I hate that word narrative, uh, her story is so flawed that to remember our past the way she wants us to remember it distorts not just what actually happened historically, 
It, it also undermines the civic trust that Americans of all races and ethnicities need to have in each other in order for our diversity, our manifold diversity, to strengthen rather than to divide us. Her approach is untrue to the actual history because it leaves out so much of the history, the facts, as she once put it. It undermines a due affection for the United States precisely by making the country unlovable and subverts the trust between citizens in its Manichaean portrayal of American progress as simply a record of heroic black virtue triumphing over continual uh, white vice. To include the contribution of white Americans of goodwill is not an indulgence, but a necessary part, I argue, of the American story. Being honest about our multiracial American story, that is what I consider the long civil rights movement, not only is true to the facts, but also essential to promoting the civic health of the body politic. What better way to engender goodwill, trust, friendship among citizens of diverse races than teaching American children a truly comprehensive, truly inclusive history of their country's political birth and development. But Nicole Hannah-Jones takes for granted the humane efforts of white Americans of goodwill, Americans who understood that the country was founded not on slavery, but on equality, and therefore worked to get our practice to align more closely with our profession. Their contribution to the increasing protection of the civil and political rights of black Americans can be seen in the landmark, uh, what we call the civil, right, uh, civil War or Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. Uh, the unanimous school desegregation decision in, in 1954, Brown v. Board of Education. Uh, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and uh, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Without significant white majorities, none of these pivotal constitutional and political events would have occurred. For Nicole Hannah-Jones to assert that anti-Black racism, as she calls it, runs in the very DNA of this country, she said, turns a blind eye to the profound conviction of most white Americans that all men really are created equal and deserve an equal opportunity to pursue the American dream. Understood this way, one sees not 1619, but 1776 as the legitimate origin of the meaning of America, the true founding and the true soul of America. The principles of the Declaration of Independence have always been looked to as the standard of America's political progress and development. President Bill Clinton, best thing he ever said was in his first inaugural address, there is nothing wrong with America that cannot be cured by what is right with America. That for me is an affirmation of the systemic justice that has guided our development as a country and as a people. If Americans of all races learn that the spirit of 76 reflects the better angel of our nature and not some demon that needs to be exercised, then they can reclaim their common political heritage. Only then can diverse Americans live out their national motto, e pluribus unum, out of many one, and have a reasonable hope for unity. But if Americans lack a conviction about the essential goodness of America, a goodness that Hannah Jones makes more difficult to see and un understand, our political polarization will only get worse. The racial mindedness of the left and the right will keep Americans caught, to quote Ralph Ellison, one of my favorite novelists, between what they profess to believe and what they feel they can't do without. During our greatest crisis of national identity, the American Civil War, Lincoln and many fellow Americans, black and white, did their best to preserve what was right about the founding in the face of both misinterpretations and outright rejections of our revolutionary fathers. Nicole Hannah-Jones essay is really, in, in the end, in my opinion, about visibility. It's about how we see America's founding, how we see black Americans, their role in this country's development, and ultimately how we see each other as fellow citizens and as fellow human beings. Her mistake 
was to interpret American history as a zero sum story where the recovered strivings of black folk had to uh, displace the recorded achievements of white folk, especially those we have been long taught to view as iconic representatives of the American way. What was needed was a more capacious revision of American history, one that definitely included the heroic participation and fealty, the loyalty of black Americans, while also wrestling more truly, which is to say more sympathetically with the challenge the founders faced in establishing a free society in a land long accustomed to racial slavery. Instead, riddled with half-truths, overstatements, out of context quotations and errors of both fact and interpretation about the founding and my specialty, Abraham Lincoln, her narrative distorts our past and actually works at cross purposes with her argument that it was black Americans who fought to make our ideals true. So in the end, Nicole Hannah Jones's lead essay for the 1619 Project is a missed opportunity to help Americans understand their past better, and therefore enable us to see and trust one another as fellow citizens of a common country, our common country. An honest account of our nation's past would tell the story of both the failure of white Americans to live up to their constitution and the many triumphs of Americans, black and white together, that marked our progress in securing the civil and political rights of all Americans. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Morell. What does your button say? It's kind of pixelated. And is, I'm going to say right up front, this is borrowed glory, people. This is a button that was worn at the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom in August 28, 1963. Martin Luther King wore one on his lapel all the organizers and a bunch of people in that black and white audience and black and white together was one of the lines they sang when they sang we shall overcome so i'm telling you i wasn't there i was born the following year <laughs> but this is borrowed glory the person who wrote this had courage attended and uh props to that to whoever that person was i, I scored it on ebay <laughs> that's excellent i have a, a a mini political button uh collection myself and and also very much appreciate Ralph Ellison, a oh, bril sorry. brilliant writer, brilliant writer across the board. So thank you so much, Dr. Morell. So you. our next panelist I'm excited to introduce is Dr. Mary uh, Graybar. I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that mm -hmm. correctly. Um, yeah. <laughs> so she's with the Alexander Hamilton Institute and also recently published a book called Debunking the 1619 Project. So I will drop her information um, as well as that of her and of the institution where she works into the chat section. So Dr. Graybar, all you. I think you're good. I think you're unmuted. Oh, am I on? Yeah. Yeah, okay, I can, this, this uh, system is a little different. Well, thanks for having me. Um, actually, I wish my book, uh, Debunking the 1619 Project, were out. I'm actually finishing it up right now. I was proofreading before uh, we started this, so it should be coming out in September. Um, but, uh, the, you know, this is all I'm thinking about is the 1619 Project. Uh, you know, and, you know, recent events where, you know, six Dr. Seuss books have been banned and you've got cartoon characters that aren't, aren't allowed. Laura Ingalls Wilder is, you know, one of my favorite childhood authors is no longer uh, politically correct. So they're going after all these things. And I'm, you know, as someone who taught English, I look at language and the rhetorical strategies that writers use as much as the facts. And I'm, uh, I'm also going through the facts, the, the lies, the misrepresentations, the half-truths, the exaggerations, and on and on. Um, but you, you think about, you know, okay, so you've got these Dr. Seuss books, and so we have to be very careful. But the language that she uses is so incendiary. 
Um, it, it, there are enslavers. Uh, Thomas Jefferson is an enslaver. That's all he is. Uh, there, he tortures slaves. Um, th that all along, um, uh, uh, black Americans have been thought of as subhuman. Plantations were labor camps. Um, we were founded as a slaveocracy, <laughs> which is one of the most absurd things when you think about how slavery was introduced here in 1619. It was almost by accident. No one was expecting that ship. Um, it just kind of developed. And as I've gone through my research, I've I, I've just come across this incredible um, information about the 17th century where um, blacks and whites were intermarrying, uh, they were working together, and eventually slavery became solidified and codified, and from slavery you get um, this, uh, you get the racism. It's not the other way around. She insists that you have racism and then you have slavery. It's not necessarily so. And so I'm, I'm, I'm uncovering the, this history. And, um, but the way um, Hannah Jones presents it is it's very mannequin. It's like it just popped out of nowhere and that the first people here just decided, well, this is going to be a slaveocracy. We're going to uh, build our, our country on this. This is how we're going to get our wealth and our power on the backs of slaves. And that is not the case. And in 1776, slavery uh, was all around the world. Uh, the only place it wasn't being practiced was in Western Europe. And then you still had the colonies. So it was a fact of life and it needs to be put into perspective. And uh, the, the people that she slams, particularly uh, Jefferson and Lincoln, uh, they always had qualms about slavery. They didn't like it. Uh, but it was a system that they were born into, and I think that needs to be exposed. Uh, one of the uh, uh, patterns I've noticed, as Professor Jacobson mentioned, uh, that this is propaganda, and it's very much like Howard Zinn's book. It uses the strategies of propaganda. Um, there's the questioning of the legitimacy of the United States. That's what Howard Zinn does. He wants readers, students to think that the United States doesn't even have a right to exist. And that's what Hannah Jones is doing. Uh, she is also pretending that this is something new, that no one knew this before. But if you read, um, you know, uh, history by African American scholars, 1619 is a year <laughs> that has been known and that has been acknowledged, uh, you know, right from the beginning. It's nothing new, but that's part of the marketing. Um, she, like Howard Zinn, uses very inflammatory, highly emotional language. And this, of course, is being taught to second graders. Uh, you know, the, the idea of a slaveocracy and slavers on and on and torture. And it's also a very simplified uh, version of history, as uh, Professor Morell just pointed out. Um, so it is really truly propaganda. There is just about no historical benefit to it. Uh, her sources are uh, disreputable historians, not even historians. Lerone Bennett is uh, a primary source for her and influence. And uh, he, he molded her thinking. So when she was in 10th grade, she was given Lerone Bennett's, um, you know, a book. Uh, for, uh, it, the title escapes me now, but that's where she learned about 1619. So 
Uh, this is an idea that was cooked up in a high school sophomore's had by a very influential teacher. And uh, so she has just kind of run with it. And this is what we're putting into the classrooms. Um, so it's, it's a very, it's very falsified history. It's propagandistic. It uses the strategies of propaganda. What to do about it? Um, I don't know if you want me to get into that now, but uh, I'm, I'm, you know, following her, I follow her tweets, I have her uh, Google alerts, and uh, she is speaking just about at least once a week and getting paid quite well for it um, and, and getting a lot of sympathy. And there are bills in five different states, including her home state of Iowa, that have been introduced this year to uh, like Tom Cotton's bill to keep this material out of classrooms, which I think is a, uh, you know, you have to have standards for classroom materials. Um, but I'm seeing a lot of letters to the editor in favor of the 1619 project. And I think these are well-intentioned people uh, who don't understand what this is. They haven't read the dozens of historical critiques, um, and they think that this is an overlooked part of history that, uh, you know, children should learn about, but they don't understand what it is. Um, I, I used to speak to Tea Party groups, and when I've been, you know, uh, speaking about my book, I always say, you know, call up legislators, write letters. Uh, the left, you know, keeps doing it all the time. Um, and I just see, you know, probably six to one letters in favor of the 1619 project to keep it in schools. And they're calling it censorship to keep it out. The argument has to be, no, this is not censorship. This is, uh, you know, maintaining educational standards. Uh, So, so that is an important, I can't stress citizen lobbying enough, um, refute the arguments, uh, the counter arguments. Uh, when I was at the White House conference, I got so many nasty posts and tweets, uh, you know, because, uh, you know, I was supporting a fascist <laughs> 1776 uh kind of curriculum and, you know, because I was white, you know, um, and I'm on this panel. Um, so, you know, the, the thing to do is to uh, refute those charges that 1776, a 1776 project or patriotic education is somehow white nationalists or uh, history and that it's whitewashing history. It's not. Um, the left has taken a term that means something good, patriotism, which is love of one's country, not necessarily saying, oh, it's perfect, but love of one's country and twisting it around. Um, so that so that's what I uh, that's what I would urge and and the reason I'm writing this book is to uh, as with Zen offer people something where they can have it and say this look this is what's wrong here she's wrong she's uh, misinterpreting something, she's misrepresenting something, she's leaving this out or this didn't happen and uh, you know, have a way to make an argument against the use of uh, this in classrooms. Uh, and absolutely, it should, you know, no second grader, sixth grader, or 12th grader should be reading this. Uh, and it is pure propaganda, in my opinion. Thank you so much, Dr. Graybar. And we have a lot of questions and I'll just throw in there too, just to kind of piggyback on some of the things you were discussing. So we have a couple small kids and are currently homeschool kindergarten or homeschooling or kindergartner 
for many of the reasons that you've mentioned. So um, I have a degree in history. I love American history and have followed a lot of the historical sites, even on Instagram. And the degree to which everything has become slavery centric is incredibly concerning. And I think it's so reductionist to turn all of American history into this one particular issue. And any of the resources that they put out, the coloring sheets, all of this kind of stuff marketed towards kids that are our children's age are all pushing this kind of garbage. And it, it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying, which of course has informed some of the decisions that we've made. Um, so I really appreciate the work that all of y'all are doing because in terms of being able to push back and to have the resources that we need to go before you know school boards or whatever, um, whomever it is that we're trying to lobby against, it's tremendously helpful. So I'm really looking forward to your book. Um, Thank you. And we'll get into a lot more of the discussion after Mr. Rowe gives his presentation. And uh, Mr. Ian Rowe is a fellow with the American Enterprise Institute, and I have a lot of information about him and the work that he's done, which I will drop into the chat section. So without further ado, Mr. Rowe. Thank you, Kimberly, and, and thank you, Professor Jacobson and Dr. Morell and Dr. Graybar. It's uh, fantastic to be working with you on this. I'm, I'm happy actually also just to be speaking about, you know, what we can do uh, about uh, the velocity at which the 1619 project has been absorbed within the American psyche. Uh, I'm here tonight actually uh, wearing two hats. Uh, first, uh, in addition to, I guess, to being a resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, I'm also a, a co-founder of 1776 Unites which is a Black-led, nonpartisan, uh, intellectually diverse alliance of writers, thinkers, activists, who are crafting solutions to some of our country's greatest challenges in education, family, culture, upward mobility. Uh, we launched 1776 Unites uh, in Valentine's Day of 2020. Uh, it was led by civil rights uh, veteran, uh, Robert Woodson, uh, and a number of black leaders who acknowledge America's history of racial discrimination, yet we recognize the pathways taken by millions of black people, past and present, who are not bound by a defeatist ideology. We are determined to spark a movement to liberate tens of millions of Americans of all races to become agents of their own uplift not by rejecting the founding principles of our country, but actually truly embracing the ideals of faith, family, hard work, entrepreneurship, education as the vehicle through which the black community moved from persecution to prosperity. So that's my first hat. And I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing at 1776 Unites. The second hat I'm wearing is as an educator. You know, I myself am a product of the New York City uh, public school system, kindergarten through 12th grade. Uh, for the last decade, I ran a network of public charter schools in the heart of the South Bronx and the Lower East Side of Manhattan. I'm now actually designing a new network of international baccalaureate high schools, also to launch in the Bronx in 2022. And when I was running Public Prep, which is the name of our network, you know, we had 2,000 students, more than 2,000 students, primarily low income, primarily black and Hispanic students, whose parents chose our schools because they wanted their children to develop the skills and habits to become agents of their own uplift, to live the American dream. And many of our parents, uh, you know, they, have may, they may have faced racial discrimination in their own lives, and felt that their kids likely would as well, but they knew that a great education would make a difference. They knew that their children may face closed doors because of America's legacy of slavery, but because of America's legacy of black excellence and resilience, 
in the face of slavery and discrimination, hundreds of doors are now open to young people. And so as we thought about delivering the education to our uh, students, not only are we thinking about math and science and reading, it's also to ensure we teach a full and complete history of our country, warts and all, so that our kids understand that they live in a good, if not great, country, a country that's not hostile to their dreams, one in which there are pathways to their success, and those pathways are often grounded in the very ideals that the New York 16, the New York Times 1619 project were saying were false when they were written. As Dr. Graybar said, the New York Times had a hypothesis that the, the country's uh, founding ideals were false uh, when they were written. It was founded as a slaveocracy, not a democracy. This is exactly the last thing we should be telling uh, young people in communities that face a whole host of issues. So it was very disheartening when we saw that the New York Times 1619 project was being adopted in, in school systems where literally the literacy rates of proficiency are in single digits or less than 20%, places like Buffalo, uh, Chicago, uh, Rochester, New York. And so when we saw that the New York Times had partnered with the Pulitzer Center, uh, to actually take the New York Times magazine issue and make it into a curriculum, then it was clear that they were not just interested in a magazine, they were interested in indoctrination. And so we've been fighting this fight on multiple fronts. So first, uh, you know, we recognize that the, the, New York, the Pulitzer Center now claims that the curriculum, the 1619 Project curriculum has been absorbed in something like 3,500 uh, classrooms across the country, which is, you know, which is a pretty uh, significant footprint. But we said, you know what, let's fight fire with fire. Because one of the things that's interesting, uh, I've actually spent time with uh, teachers and watched webinars of teachers who have actually uh, taught the 1619 Project in their classrooms. And it's really important that we don't demonize many of these teachers. They're, they're not necessarily bought into a propagandist, propagandistic view of the United States. They actually had a yearning to tell a more complete story of the African-American experience in the United States. And so if you actually start with that premise, then it's not to demonize these folks because they, they basically thought, well, the 1619 Project was the only game in town. So we at the 1776 Unites uh, team said, let's create a curriculum that is uh, an empowering alternative that tells stories that are incredibly just ignored in New York Times 1619 Project. Imagine, for example, the Rosenwald schools, which hopefully many uh, viewers know was Booker T. Washington uh, during Jim Crow segregation partnered with Julius Rosenwald, who at the time was head of the Sears company, the nation's largest retailer, and said, look, just because you know, our schools are segregated and, uh, and, and our black kids are essentially getting a terrible education, we can still rise. We can build a network of exceptional schools exclusively for black children in the heart of the South during Jim Crow. They partnered together and built more than 5,000 schools. It's an extraordinary story of black resilience, unbelievable adversity. You will not find a single word about the Rosenwald schools in the entire 1619 Project. So it became clear to us that this was a cherry picked uh, version of American history that was determined to create and to fulfill a contemporary propagandistic agenda. And so we have now built uh, the first stage of what will ultimately be a K through 12 curriculum, completely philanthropically supported. So it's free to anyone who wants it in the country. We launched it about four months ago. So right now, only at the high school level, we've already had more than eight thousand downloads 
of the, of the 1776 Unites curriculum. And again, that's only for grades nine through 12. All the, uh, the other components are coming. We're very proud of that because it suggests to us that creating an empowering alternative, which doesn't run away from slavery or any of the atrocities, but tells the authentic stories of people like Biddy Mason, uh, a woman who was born a slave and ultimately died a millionaire and a great philanthropist. How did she do that? Incredible stories. Um, uh, Elijah McCoy, the child of runaway slaves who became a great inventor and engineer whose products were so superior that they were knockoffs created and went, but when engineers went to buy their products and they were offered a knockoff, they said, no, 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 no. I want the real McCoy, which is a phrase many people don't know of, but these are the kinds of jewels of stories that are now in the 1776 Unites curriculum that we feel provides that compelling alternative for many teachers who frankly aren't, they don't necessarily wanna be part of some political effort. They just want their kids of all races to have a broader understanding of the African-American experience in the United States. And that's what we think uh, we, we have helped to deliver. So that's thing one that we've done. The thing two, uh, as Dr. Graybar said, and I've now testified uh, at several state boards of education uh, in Ohio, just um, uh, last week, I testified in New Hampshire. Uh, in Ohio, uh, the 1619 project had been placed on the official uh, Ohio resources page for social studies as a, as a, a curriculum. Uh, and several of the State Board of Education members were uncomfortable with that. So I appeared as a guest uh, speaker. And what, what was supposed to be a three minute speech turned out to be a 35, 40 minute conversation with the state school board members to talk about how dangerous some of the falsehoods that were embedded within the 1619 project were, and it didn't deserve to be uh, on the uh, on the official Ohio resource page. And so, after my testimony, it was removed. You know, so uh, and and just last week, I uh, testified uh, in New Hampshire. It's happening all over the country. So, Dr. Graybar, I hear you when you say that maybe there are letters, but what's interesting, what I'm finding is that there are a number of uh, state school board members, local school board members who are very uncomfortable with what the 1619 project has to offer, but A, they don't really know that there's a compelling alternative, and B, they need more of us uh, to either run for school board or do presentations at school boards to point out uh, these flaws. And I think, I think there's a greater uh, opposition that you might appreciate right now. So hopefully when your uh, book uh, comes out, you will also be able to tap into that. And let me just close, because I do, I do want to get uh, to questions, because as I, as I said with uh, the Rosenwald schools, one of the, the biggest things about the 1619 Project is everything it omits, because it would clash with the narrative, you know, the fact that there's so little mention of Frederick Douglass, for example, uh, and all the things Dr. Morell has said about President Lincoln but I came across a passage of, from Martin Luther King, his address at the centennial of the Emancipation Proclamation. So 100 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, here's what Martin Luther King said in his opening paragraph, quote, if our nation had done nothing more in its whole history than to create just two documents, its contribution to civilization would be imperishable. The first of these documents is the Declaration of Independence, and the other is that which we are here to honor tonight, the Emancipation Proclamation. All tyrants, past, present, and future, are powerless to bury the truths in these declarations no matter how extensive their legions, no matter how vast their power, no matter how malignant their evil, end quote. I think Dr. Martin Luther King was somewhat uh, prophetic when he made uh, those words, because you could really see the architects of the New York Times 1619 project 
trying to tell a very different story. And I think we should all remain optimistic that the core founding values, even if our country has not always lived up to them, we as a country are constantly in pursuit of becoming a more perfect union. And the way that we arrive at that place is an embrace of our founding principles, not a rejection of them. And that's why we have to stand against the New York Times 1619 project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Rowe. That was fantastic and encouraging and enlightening. I always love when we are able to highlight the work that people are doing in their space. Um, because that's a question that we get most frequently is what can we do? There are so many people who are watching what's happening and are um, and just feel powerless and, and helpless because these things, whether it's critical race training, which we've cataloged extensively, whether it's a 1619 project, which is very new as as these things go. But as you mentioned, the velocity with which this has taken off and how quickly it's already infiltrated educational systems, both public and private and higher education and primary education is incredibly concerning. And so um, that is a question I think that a lot of people would like an answer to is what can they do? So if you're a parent and you see some of this stuff filtering into your school or, or this is up for discussion that maybe the local school board is going to um, to take this up. What what can they do? Does anyone have any suggestion for that? Well, I'll, I'll draw on some of the things we talked about in the prior programs on uh, critical race training in K through 12, particularly. And one of our prior panelists made the point show up okay the people who show up are the people who tend to get their way at the local level who shows up for school board meetings <laughs> it tends to be the activists it tends to be the people who care and we're at home we're cooking dinner we're getting the kids ready um, we're not showing up and i think that you know if your local school board is introducing this material object to it, show up and object to it, ask them to sponsor some sort of debate about it, ask them to bring in alternatives, but you have to show up and you have to make your voices known because the people who are pushing this stuff, this is what they do. They are obsessed with this stuff, whether it's critical race theory, whether it's anti-racism training, whether it is um, social justice, they are passionate about it. And they don't necessarily do nefarious things behind the scenes. They show up. They get themselves on the committees. They take over the parent-teacher association. They make themselves home, uh, heard. And, you know, we've seen that even in, in the town that I live in in Rhode Island, where the people who are involved in the town council and who show up for these things are the people who are pushing this. And... Uh, and they're almost shocked when somebody else shows up who opposes it. So if I said had one recommendation is if you're upset about what is going on, you cannot be complacent. It's not going to self-correct. You have to get involved. And the other thing is you have to understand no one person can do it all. And I understand this. There's a lot of people feel, well, I'm going to go to the school board and I'm going to argue with them and maybe I'll get them to change something. But you know what? There's 10,000 other school boards around the country and I can't change them. So this doesn't matter. But it does matter if the, there are more people who don't believe this and who are upset about it, I guarantee you, than people who actually support this stuff and the people who are against it have to show up. Yeah, and one, one of the things that, that I always like to remind people, and it's kind of my, my personal saga in all of this and with the platform that we have, is to remind people that you're not alone. I mean, we have how right. many people logged into this event? There are people. Uh, who <laughs> I have no idea what that was. Was that, am I the only one that told me? Let me mute myself. 
sorry about that, um, is that you're not alone uh, because we have close to 200 people who are logged into this event alone. And, and I know for a fact that just because we have that many logins, we have multiple people on each one of these logins, right? And there are people all over the country doing this work. There are people all over the country who are showing up at school boards who are concerned about these things and, and that many more that are concerned about these things and feeling lost and feeling alone. And in a day and age where we're watching massive deplatforming happening across the internet in every single sphere for anyone who says anything that's considered wrong think by the current powers that be, the appearance is that is often that we are alone or you are alone. But I just want to remind you that though some days it might look that way, you are not. You are absolutely no, it's not. A, it's, and so it, it's a very yeah, it's a very powerful point. I mean, ju just to give you a sense, I'm 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 practicing what I preach because uh, earlier today I submitted my candidacy for the Pelham uh, New York School Board to become a member of the school board uh, in my hometown for the exact uh, reasons that you say. And in my uh, position statement, I talk about the need for us to uh, tell a more complete history. And it's quite amazing how many uh, of my neighbors are extremely supportive. Uh, one thing I did not mention in my earlier uh, uh, remarks, uh, there's several new organizations. I see that there's someone who asked a question from Britain, uh, Helen Pluckrose, uh, I think her uh, name has just created an organization called Counterweight. Uh, which is an organization that provides resources to parents so that you can get a sense if you see curricula like this being introduced in your school. Uh, here are some of the things that you can do. There's also a new organization called FAIR, the Foundation Against Intolerance, Intolerance and Racism. Uh, I'm, I'm an advisor there. Uh, and so at fairforall.org, we're actually creating a sort of clearinghouse of all the resources that can help parents. So for example, in uh, the city of Aspen, uh, believe it or not, they were considering implementing the 1619 project. It looks like now that is on hold based on a number of actions taken by the local school board and some parents in that community. As you mentioned, Dr. Graybar, Iowa uh, is putting forth uh, legislation. I'll be testifying uh, there. It looks like in a couple of weeks, same thing in Utah. So. Part of what we want to do is create a central place so that any parent or school board member who's feeling uncomfortable can actually see and read about uh, opposition that's happening. And then the very last thing I'll say is that usually the curriculum is just one part of a larger onslaught. It's the anti, it's the anti-bias training. Uh, uh, you know, the, the division of, of uh, teachers, you know, have the white teachers here, the black teachers there. There's a, there's a, and Dr. And Professor Jacobson, this should interest you, there seems to be a growing set of cases that are demonstrating that this, these divisions by race are violations of Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. So it seems like there's also a fertile ground in terms of a legal uh, framework to bar some of these actions. Absolutely. Um, and before I get to more questions, I do want to address this because there have been several questions asking this. This is being recorded. We will share, if you have registered for the event, you'll, you'll get a link to the full recording after the fact. It'll also be on the blog. Um, and we also have a resource page on criticalrace.org, which is a project of the Legal Insurrection Foundation, and we'll be cataloging all of the resource links that I've put into the chat tonight. Those will all be there um, for your reference in the future. So just to, to get that out of the way. Um, just, to, just as a measure to tell you how much interest there is out there in pushing back. So we rolled out criticalrace.org in early February. I was fortunate enough to have a, a TV appearance on, on Tucker. Carlson, I was on at 8.30 to announce it. By midnight that night, we had 400,000 page views. We had 79,000 people 
on the website at one time, which is insane. Okay, I can tell you as someone who's run a website for 13 years, um, it's a miracle it didn't crash. That's the sort of interest there was. Um, by the next day, we had a million. Um, and it hasn't kept that pace, but the point is there's enormous, enormous interest. And you know what? We have a contact box there. And the number one thing we heard from people is your website is a, regards higher education. When are you going to do something for K through 12? So we have added K through 12 resources there. But my point is not what we have on that website. The point is there is an enormous interest out there. We hear every day from multiple parents saying they're disgusted with what's going on. But, and the other message I get is people feel like they're being swarmed, that this came out of nowhere, okay? And in 2020, all of a sudden, it's coming from the government, it's coming from corporations, it's coming in their kindergarten, it's coming in their universities. Don't be overwhelmed by it. Solve whatever you can solve and give support to other people, but don't be overwhelmed with it because most people in this country do not want their children being taught math that they don't have to show their proof, okay? I don't believe that. The parents of no race in this country or ethnicity want their children taught math improperly, but that is what is happening. And there's gonna be a big pushback, but it's taking a little time to organize because people feel like it came out of nowhere. We know it didn't come out of nowhere, but they feel that way. And I think this time next year, there will be a very strong movement pushing back against this. It's developing already. There is, because it's a space that's, as Professor Jacobson just said, it's very new because people are just now, because of virtual school, overhearing their kids in an inherent bias training and they're getting a clue as to what their kids are learning on a daily basis. And so it's a sphere that is really still organic and it's just now mobilizing. It's just now organizing. So get involved where you can and in the ways that you can. Um, a, doing a little bit is so much better than doing nothing at all because you can't assume someone else is going to step up and do this for you. Our kids are worth it. Their future is worth it. The future of our country is worth it. And I think that one of the best things we can do, which I know that the panelists have discussed too, is to ensure that they're learning the founding principles and to ensure that any gaps in what they may be receiving in education and at school are being filled in by what we can teach them about founding principles because there's something about the truth that as, as Mr. Rowe mentioned and Martin Luther King's words, there's something about the truth that just resonates with those seeking the truth. And there's something about it that's undeniable. And there are so many truisms in our founding documents. And so those things can take root and, and take hold in the best of ways. And I think that that's what most people want for their kids, seeing as they are the future of this country. Um, so to get to, to other questions, um, this is one from one of our participants. Do, has anyone seen any efforts to build on the work of the 1776 project report, which appeared in the last days of the Trump administration, and as we all know, was thrown out immediately once um, the new administration stepped in? Has anyone... Anyone have any knowledge of that? If not, that's okay too. Um, I'm I'm uh, aware that the 1776 um, document is they're still um, developing additional materials for that, but I'm not I'm I'm not aware of what the venues or the outlets are going to be uh, for that. So I mean, if you're I'm on Twitter, I don't do a lot of Facebook, but I'm on Twitter and I've seen. Um, some activity about that on Twitter. I know people who are involved with it very well. Um, I was not a contributor to the original report. Um, 
but I mean, pe people slammed it as being not you know, really a, you know, a history of the American Revolution. It was not intended to be a history of the American Revolution. It was, it was intended to be a civics lesson. And um, uh, most of the major, uh, uh, major media failed that lesson because they couldn't recognize it. Okay, um, this is another question that we have. And she asks, is it too late? Critical race training in the 1619 project have taken hold in the media, the culture, the academy, and now corporations. How can we effectively think about battling it from the outside? Well, uh, since my I'm unmuted, let me just say uh, quickly: a new organization that has academics ref, uh, left, right, and center called the Academic Freedom Alliance, of which I'm a founding member and I'm on the academic committee. Uh, we've established this group to begin to put universities on notice if they harass, um, threaten, or uh, uh, or fire any of their employees, but especially professors, for exercising their freedom of speech in the classroom, in their curriculum, or even in their private lives as citizens. And we even have a legal group and funding uh, to make some fairly uh, public uh, our case is public so that we can put them all on notice to be faithful to their own mission, which is to the pursuit of knowledge and truth about various subjects dealing with human beings and society and in the world. And so we're at least trying to preserve a space uh, on American colleges and university campuses to uh, uh, allow students to actually see the true diversity of thought that leads to knowledge so that schools don't simply become indoctrination centers uh, like they do through freshman orientation uh, as well as in in other ways and and you know it's not news to show that the um, the, the in academia it leans um, uh, to the left politically that should not infiltrate the classroom uh, but it, it can in in many ways and unfortunately among administrators it's almost monolithic in terms of the political persuasion and so it's, it's tough in that kind of environment to create an, a, a venue so that students can truly uh, be liberated from their prejudices and mere opinions and to actually discover that knowledge is found through a diversity of thought, not simply by being told this is the right way to think and, uh, or else. And so at least uh, colleges were trying to do what we can to make those a space for that freedom of thought and, and I'm hoping that parents will start looking for that and asking for that uh, in terms of that intellectual vibrancy. What can you show me on your campus that shows that my child isn't simply going to be uh, fed, you know, X, Y, and Z is the way it's the way to think, but rather to be um, thoughtful and entertain different points of view, et cetera. What can you show me to prove that? Have you had any experience with deplatforming of, of invited speakers uh, or of your own professors? And if they can't show decent evidence of that, parents should vote with their feet, which is to say vote with their money. Don't send your kid to a school um, that's not going to truly train your kid to think for himself. I mean, I think the question was also, you know, is it too late? I guess that's something I can't even think about, okay? That it's, that's too big a question for me. I think you've got to just keep on fighting and you've got to try to change things. And is it a bad situation? Yes, it's a bad situation. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The, you know, just a perfect example of how this was really a generational project, maybe a multi-generational project to undo the country um, through the education system. Doesn't mean somebody had a master plan, but it was the route that people went. And when, the, when I think about um, when I graduated law school in 1984, the career paths that people took, most people went into private law practice or companies or business or something like that. But the activist students went into academia. And one of those activist students who was my classmate was the person who invented the concept of intersectionality, which now is the dominant concept on campus. So 
I wasn't in academia my whole career. Most of it, I wasn't. Um, but there are people who saw academia as a path to activism. And that has now migrated from the universities into the, the lower grades. Uh, so is it a bad situation? Absolutely, it is a bad situation. But to me, it's a, an unnatural situation that cannot continue, okay? Uh, there is going to be pushback to this. And when the pushback comes, I think it's going to be extremely strong. And I think it's going to be extremely productive. But I wouldn't even think about whether it's too late. I would just get up every morning and go to the school board and fight the fights you can fight. Uh, don't worry about those massive questions because otherwise you'll get depressed and you'll lack motivation. And that's what they want. Okay, they would like the people who are fomenting this would like all of us on this video and everyone we know to say it's too late it's over i'm not going to it's a waste of my time to go to the school meeting to the school committee meeting. I just think we can't even think about that. Uh, Bob Bob Woodson often says to me in the fight against uh, between David versus Goliath, he says, remember, David won. And I, it's a, it's a, it's a good, it's a good reminder. And and again, uh, I, I just view this as there's been a bit of a head start, and we are catching up. So there's a there's a great case that's happening right now in Las Vegas, Professor Jacobson. You may be familiar with this, but there is a a mom of mixed race, uh, black and white, whose son is I think in seventh grade in a, a charter school in Las Vegas. He looks white. And he was in a class where the, the school forced him to stand up to have to declare his oppressive tendency because he's, he's white. And, uh, and the, the irony, of course, is that he's of, he's of mixed race, he looks white. But the mom got a hold of this and said, this is not right. And so she has filed a lawsuit. It looks like it's going to be moving forward with a, a case of, again, a civil rights violation. There are multiple of these uh, cases uh, popping up, and they seem to be uh, quite uh, powerful because, you know, when these laws were created, they were primarily focused on uh, Blacks, people being victimized, but it looks like they will be very useful in the pushback against uh, what is happening now with critical race theory. I think that's right. I think that this will be litigation will be needed and will be justified. Uh, but I also think that people need to understand that people who are, I'd say, roughly on our side, and first of all, this is not a right versus left issue. I mean, let's make that clear right away. This is not conservative versus liberal, okay? This is undermining education. But, you know, the activist groups who would push back against this, the groups who would push back against this, are not as well equipped legally as the activists who are in favor of it. Um, on, you know, it took 21 attorney generals almost two months to bring a lawsuit against the shutdown of the Keystone XL pipeline. If the roles were reversed, there would have been eight um, left wing activist groups in court the next day in eight different courts around the country took us two months to get a lawsuit filed on that. So I think that this notion of, um, you know, where you're separating people by race, where you're asking them to comment on their own race, where you are demonizing them because of their race, I think those are grounds for potential lawsuits. But we don't really have the infrastructure right now. I know there are groups and, uh, Two of our speakers have mentioned them who are looking into funding those efforts, but there are no, there really are not a lot of organizations who are equipped to do that right now. We're starting way behind. We're starting way behind. I agree, but I think. I think there are enough people who are now activated and if everyone gets involved and does their part we will be just fine. So <laughs> I remain hopeful. Um, I'm always David one. 
Yeah, that's right. So it's always, I'm always the hopeless optimist. Yeah, but Professor Jacobson's far more on the realistic side of everything. And I'm going, no, we can do this. So, um, but I would like to just, um, just final thoughts from our panel. And then, um, and maybe we could, uh, let's see, hang on just a second. Yeah, if we could just go around, um, we'll start with Dr. Graybar and then Dr. Morell and then Mr. Rowe, um, just final thoughts. And I think this is a good one. Maybe we could incorporate into it. Someone asked, are you hopeful that there is going to be a positive change here? Yeah, um, well, I, I'm, I, I'm familiar with the uh, 1776 um, UNITES project. I, I think it's a great effort and, um, and I think it's doing something for these kids uh, who they are targeting the most vulnerable kids with the 1619 project. These are kids who need hope, who need something positive. I, I have a friend who teaches in an inner city school and I've seen these kids. You don't want to tell them that they live in a country that is a slaveocracy. <laughs> That's the last thing they need. Uh, I honestly feel that the 1619 Project, teaching it is child abuse. It's emotional abuse. It, pits students against each other by race. It makes people hate their country. It's, it's akin to telling a child uh, that you should hate your family. This is who you're a part of, for better or for worse. This is where you live. And to instill that feeling that everyone is against me and to do that day after day in schools is, is, is abuse of a child. And, and these are young kids that are being taught this. And I'm so glad to see the 1776 effort uh, because that's, that's exactly what we need. And, um, and, I, and I also think one of the ways to approach the 1619 project in terms of criticizing it is that all these other uh, curricular materials have to go through a vetting process. Uh, you know, textbooks have to go through peer reviews. But this is, uh, you know, this was written, concocted by someone who's thinking back to her 10th grade Black Studies class and reading Lerone Bennett's, and I saw it on the comments, thank you whoever put it there, it's before the Mayflower. It's, that is a work of propaganda, and here she is selling it as propaganda. It doesn't even approach legitimate history. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, uh, you know, the left has, you know, I know it's not right versus left, but the activists have this strategy, which is to smear people, attack them on the basis of their race, call them a racist, call them a white nationalist or whatever. And I think, you know, by coming back with the positive things like the 1776 Unites project and, uh, you know, the fact that we want the best for our kids. We don't want them to be angry. We don't want them taking to the streets, knocking down statues, you know, they don't even know who a Union soldier is versus a Confederate. They're knocking everything down because they're so ignorant as they're being taught this stuff. So, um, so anyway, this this was really good. Thanks for inviting me. I, you know, I'm glad to meet you online. <laughs> Uh, the one hopeful thing, and perhaps, this is pure speculation, but one hopeful thing is that we have not yet seen these additional publications and film productions that Nicole Hannah-Jones was uh, working with uh, to produce. In other words, they're going to have a graphic novel, they're going to have, you know, mm -hmm. adult stuff, they're going to have a book based on the 1619 Project magazine, not just her essay. And then she was working with Lionsgate and Oprah Winfrey's outfit to 
uh, produce um, some um, movies, but they got hit so hard, so quickly, and so widely. Um, the vast majority of the, uh, the historians who critique the project are not conservatives, right? Um, and they were on that World Socialist, we uh, you know, WSWS website, World Socialist website. Um, they got hit so hard, so fast, and uh, by such a diverse group of scholars, many of whom I know, uh, even one of the fact checkers, Leslie Harris of Northwestern University, I was at a quote unquote debate with her. It wasn't really a debate. We just expressed our opinion about the 1690 project. She's in favor of the project, but she pointed out to them that they were just wrong. Her, she is a student of the American, uh, uh, the early American um, colonial period. And she said, you, you really can't say that they declared independence to preserve slavery because that's not true. And they ignored her. And she went public with that in a, in a long essay in Politico online and where she said two things, you know, they were wrong about this. They didn't, they didn't retract it, uh, but I'm in favor of the project. She's very, uh, um, a very decent lady and again, agreed with the, the gist of it, but they, they weren't interested. It didn't fit their story that they were trying to uh, tell. So uh, but the real point I wanted to make is one sign of, uh, of hope is that, yeah, I mean, I, 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 where are these movies? Where are these books? Where's the graphic novel? Um, I, I, again, pure speculation on my part, but I think they're going slower now because nobody wants to be tied to something that historians have said, not all of them, but very reputable prize-winning historians have said, there's not much history here. It is both what they included and what they excluded is so bad and by the heaps, right? That I'm, you know, Oprah Winfrey, she she is the most admired woman in the United States, if not the world. Uh, and I don't know that she wants to have her name tied to something unless they, they come correct, as you were, right? They, Ralph Ellison said, yeah, even homeboys have to do their homework. And so unless they can produce something that is more scholarly than what the magazine put out, I don't think we're going to hear very much. So uh, I think it's good news. That it's been almost two years since that uh, magazine came out in August of 2019. And uh, unless uh, I'd love to hear if somebody knows um, uh, uh, of any of these things surfacing, uh, I'd love to see them. So I, I think we're, we're seeing something of the pendulum going back. Unfortunately, what's on the upswing, if, if 1619, the pendulum is swinging back, what's on the upswing is clearly everybody wants to be quote unquote anti-racist. But unfortunately, what comes under anti-racist the Kendi book, the D'Angela book, right? right um, How to be an anti-racist and white fragility. These books are so bad in terms of their logic. They're so flawed in terms of their reasoning, reasoning and certainly in terms of their understanding of what true human equality is and equal protection of the law. Uh, but unfortunately, the easiest thing for college administrations to do right now is to have those people as speakers, is to assign those books as first, you know, first year reads, and to have that stuff infiltrate the first year uh, in some form or fashion, the first year uh, orientation. Uh, that unfortunately, that pendulum is still swinging and, and, and not in a good way. And that one is going to be a tougher one, uh, a tougher uh, a problem to undo. Well, uh, let me let me close by uh, quoting from uh, chapter 13 of de Tocqueville's America, because I think it's helpful to uh, reflect on his observation of the country, you know, centuries ago, quote, the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation but rather in her ability to repair her faults, end quote. I've always found that statement compelling because it resonates with the notion that America is always in pursuit of becoming a more perfect union. And it is true that the founders laid out inspiring ideals, were constantly in an effort to fully live up to them but how we've made steady progress is through an optimistic viewpoint, through uniting around a common set of ideals, civil discourse, constructive disagreement, and a strong foundation in the founding principles. Again, family, faith, hard work, 
entrepreneurship, education. We actually have to lean on these principles, even at this moment when it seems so uh, remote that this effort can win. But believe you me, and I think Kimberly, you said it, we are not alone. There are many millions and millions of people are throughout this country who just want their kids to have a great shot in this country. They don't believe that the, the country has anti-racism DNA running through, you know, anti-racism blackness or anti-black racism running through its DNA, or that the country is permanently racist. These are negative connotations that there is right now a dominant narrative, but I do believe the greatness of America lies not in being more enlightened than any other nation, but rather in her ability to repair her faults. If we continue to believe that, I believe that we will make it through this and be a stronger country. Well, my concluding remarks are similar to some of the things we've talked about already tonight, which is that we are in the right here. We are um, have the best interests of our children at heart and the best interests of the nation at heart. And we have the better arguments. We just have to make them we have to fight them and we have to show up more than anything. And we have to do what we can do. Everybody can do a little bit of something. Uh, you know, maybe I'm not the best one to show up for a school board because I don't have kids in the school system, but there are other things I can do. Um, and as somebody who lives in an environment where, trust me, I am almost alone, um, at least publicly, um, I understand what people go through but you simply have to keep arguing because there are more people who agree with you. They're just afraid to stand up and say it. So the people who can stand up and speak out on these issues have to do it. And I think the fact that it, probably many, if not most of the people who are attending tonight have that ability. And it's really important that people do something. It, I almost don't care what you do, but do something. And when we have millions of people doing something, they're not going to know what hit them, just like the proprietors of the 1619 Project, who thought they were the masters of the universe, okay? And then they got hit with some truth, and they got hit with some criticism, and they got hit with some negative publicity, and now they're back on their heels. They haven't given up, but they're back on their heels. So... We need millions of people to reclaim the education system, to rescue history and education. And if everybody does a little something, they will not know what hit them. Completely agree. And I, um, again, my name is Kimberly Kay. I'm with the Legal Insurrection Foundation. And I want to personally thank our fantastic panel this evening for taking time to share their work their thoughts and their expertise on on the 1619 project and i want to thank every single one of you for tuning in and for joining us tonight again we will be publishing this entire program on legal insurrection and criticalrace.org um, sometime in the next week or two and you will get an email with links to those things um, we so appreciate you remember you are not alone stand up say something, you you have a voice, use it, okay? I realize that sounds so silly and trite, but it's so true. Just to what whatever is in front of you, use that to the best that you're able to, and we will be just fine. So thank you again, wishing you all a fantastic rest of your evening, and um, we'll see you online. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.